This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Wine. It has ancient roots going back about 8,000 years. The Mesopotamian cultures, Greece and Rome, they all had wine, an alcoholic beverage made from fermented grapes. Archaeological evidence through chemical analysis of stone jars and the discovery of a wine press tell us that in Georgia, Iran, and Armenia, wine, or something very like it, was brightening the days and nights of ancient peoples. Beyond its inebriating effects, wine became a cultural phenomenon over the centuries, even assuming a religious function in some societies. Today, wine is still considered a part of daily life, something without which a good meal would be incomplete. So why all this talk about wine, one of the world's favorite beverages here at the beautiful Hacienda de las Rosas winery in Ramona? Well, in a funny kind of way, the plot of the opera I'm gonna discuss with you hinges on a simple little bottle of Bordeaux. Now, the story takes place sometime in the early 19th century in a little Italian village, so believe me, no one in that village had a clue about all the medicinal benefits of wine. But a traveling salesman convinces our hero that this particular bottle of vino is actually a love potion. And not just any love potion, but Isolde's love potion, harking back to that medieval love story between the Irish princess and her stalwart knight, Tristan. And who could possibly be so naive, so innocent, so unschooled in the ways of the world that he would fall for this obvious ruse? A young man by the name of Nemorino, a name which, by the way, in Latin means a little nobody. That love potion and that innocent young man are at the heart of one of the most delightful Italian comic operas ever penned, La Lisir d'Amore, or The Elixir of Love, by Gaetano Donizetti. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. Donizetti was a man of the theater entirely. There's no indication that teaching or performing, the sorts of things that would have kept a Mozart or a Beethoven or another composer of that era busy when they didn't have success at opera, would have brought in some extra cash. So that singular overnight success that every composer looked for eluded him for quite some time. Then came the occasion to be part of a special festival season at the Teatro Carcano in Milan. His response, the opera Anna Bolena, a historical lyric tragedy based on the story of Henry VIII's second wife. This opera in two acts was an absolute sensation. Now this may have been due as much to the cast as to Donizetti's music. It included the soprano who created the role of Norma for Bellini, Giudita Pasta, who played the role of Anne Boleyn. And the tenor Giovanni Rubini was also in it. He played her lover, Percy. These two singers, who were practically bound at the hip to the composer Vincenzo Bellini, were considered the greatest opera stars of their day. Their reputations guaranteed success at just about every important opera house in Europe. But Anna Bolena must be seen as the culmination of all those years struggling away in Napoli, a final maturation point for the composer Donizetti, who must have felt by this time like the eternal bridesmaid, never the bride. The success of the piece confirmed his arrival as a significant composer of serious Italian opera. And within a year, Anna Bolena was given in Paris and London with Pasta and Rubini, traveling to those cities to reprise their principal roles. <laughs> this success also spurred the creation of the operas Gianni di Parigi at La Scala, three more operas for Naples, and Ugo Conte di Parigi again at La Scala. These were all serious operas, tragedies, melodramas, for which the young composer was certainly fit, and they continued to support a growing Donizetti cult. 
Mind you, this was an extraordinarily busy time for the composer. He was typically writing at the rate of two operas per year, but in the year 1832, he was going to produce four operas, one in January, one in March, one in May, and a final one in November. It was in the midst of all this activity that he got a commission on very short notice to write an opera for the Teatro Cannobiana in Milan, a commission that would become Donizetti's greatest success, actually the greatest success of his entire career, the opera L'Elysir d'Amore, The Elixir of Love. So we come to the pivotal year of 1832 in the young Donizetti's life when he's commissioned in April of that year to produce an opera to have its first performance in May. This, by the way, at the same time that he's completing a commission for La Scala. As his librettist for this project, he had the poet Felice Romani, the most prolific opera librettist of his day. This is a poet who eventually wrote about 80 librettos, a number of which were set by more than one composer. He is most remembered, though, as the poet who inspired Bellini's greatest works, and he'd already produced three or four works for Donizetti, including the vastly popular Anna Bolena. Insofar as the text was concerned, then, the composer was in very good hands. Even so, to produce an opera in a matter of two to four weeks, based on whoever you decide to believe, was an extraordinary task. The reason for this flurry of activity is that a composer for the theater had failed to fulfill his commission, and the impresario responsible for the opera season needed something to replace that missing work. Well, who else to turn to than Romani and Donizetti, who even at this point in their careers had already written scads of pieces for the lyric stage. Elixir was based on a libretto by the French poet Eugène Scribe for the composer Daniel Aubert, whose opera Le Filtre had only premiered at the Paris Opera the year before. Romani's work was again adapting a work that had been written for the French stage, but giving it all the necessary pathos and sentimentality that would be appropriate for the Italian stage. In doing this, he gave Donizetti many opportunities in the score to go from playfulness and hilarity to moments of sadness, disappointment, or heartache. This combination of comedy and sentiment worked perfectly, and Elixir was an immediate success with the audience in Milan. But even Donizetti had his misgivings about the cast. In words tinged with sarcasm, he said to his librettist, it bodes well that we have a German prima donna, a tenor who stammers, a buffo who has a voice like a goat, and a French bass who doesn't do much of anything at all. Composers had to deal with much more than simply the insecurities of the singers, the bellicosity of the impresarios, and the insensitivity of the players in the pit. One wonders that any opera written in Italy between 1790 and the invention of electric stage lighting in the late 1800s had any success at all. But that's exactly what Donizetti achieved with The Elixir of Love, success, and lots of it. Within a couple of years, it had been performed at every important opera house of Europe, North America, and even those in Cairo, Alexandria, and Algiers in Northern Africa. Between 1838 and 1848, it was the most performed Italian opera in the world. The Elixir of Love takes place in a small Italian village in the early 19th century. Adina, a wealthy local girl with a spunky personality, is beloved by all, but especially by the young Nemorino, who feels that he has nothing to offer her but love. A visiting soldier, Sergeant Belcore, arrives with his troop and makes a show of proposing marriage to Adina, which she agrees to consider. Poor Nemorino approaches Adina, trying to stammer his way through his own proposal, but she tells him that he'd be better off looking after his ailing uncle and forget about her. She even admits that she's as fickle as a summer breeze. A traveling quack, Dr. Dulcamara, arrives selling a potion that he says can cure just about anything, and he convinces Nemorino that it can also be a very powerful love potion. It is, of course, nothing more than a cheap Bordeaux. The good doctor does succeed in getting Nemorino to spend good money on it, 
and strengthened by a couple of drinks, he tries to approach Adina once more. She is, of course, aghast at Nemorino's inebriated state and tells Belcore that she will marry him immediately. Will Nemorino eventually succeed in getting the hand of Adina in marriage? Will he ever come to realize that the love potion is just Dr. Dulcamara's crude ploy for money? And why are all the women in the village suddenly attracted to Nemorino in the second act? Ultimately, the question is, will Adina ever come around? Well, you'll have to see the opera to find out. As I said earlier, we're here in Ramona at the Hacienda de las Rosas winery, and my interview guest today is the owner and the vintner of the winery, William Holzhauer. William, welcome. Thank you. Well, I guess I should say you've welcomed us. <laughs> Thank you very much for hosting Opera Talk today. What is it about Ramona that attracts you as a vintner? Well, that's a good question. Ramona is a lot like Tuscany. Okay, Our, our elevation here goes... Uh, uh, almost perfect for growing many, many of the, of the grapes that exist in the world. So we can grow uh, from Chardonnays uh, all the way to the big reds. Uh, so not necessarily Italian wines uh, or no, they can varietals, grow all but over. just anything. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's because of the, the climate, the, the role of the hills, I mean, what, what, the soil, what is it? Well, it's a lot of those and the combination of it. Um, we, uh, you know, grapes started here in, in San Diego in the 1700s with the Spanish Padres. Um, they were uh, very prolific until Prohibition, uh, closing down 45 wineries. As of today, I believe there's over 70 wineries in San Diego County alone, at least 20 of us here in Ramona. So Ramona becoming a destination. That's a remarkable statistics to me because being, again, a native San Diegan, I think of Temecula to the north as being wine country, sure. and I don't automatically think of San Diego County as being a center of the wine art, the wine craft. Um, when did this happen? Well. <laughs> I mean, outside of the Mission Padre, the Spanish <laughs> All the way padre. back to then. Yeah. Um, it, it really a, a, has been an explosion uh, due to the fact that, that there was an ordinance passed uh, quite a few, about three years ago, that will allow us to open our tasting rooms by right of zoning. Uh -huh. So it becomes inexpensive as a farmer to open up your product line to the public, mm -hmm. allowing them to sample your wines on your property. So that, uh, along with the fact that agriculturally, uh, we're changing from a, a high water use, such as avocados and citrus, down to a very low water use of grapes. Mm -hmm. So this has become an environmental issue. It's become a sustainable issue, and we're seeing all types of, of wonderful grapes growing here and people making incredible wines in San Diego. What are some of the grapes that you've got growing here that you're particularly proud of? Very proud of our Tempranillo, a wonderful Spanish grape. Uh, we just planted uh, Albarino, which is a white Spanish grape. But the Merlot is great, the Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Syrah, Syrahs. Some of our dessert wines, such as the Orange Muscats, do extremely well. Uh, and, and we're very proud of the grapes that we do have. I can't help, of course, because this is opera talk, to tie it into the story of uh, Nemorino in The Elixir of Love, who's duped into thinking that this cheap bottle of Bordeaux is a magic love potion. But that does beg the question that, uh, what is it we've learned about wine scientifically and health-wise in the last few years about what it does for us, that, it, that it's actually not just something to be enjoyed, but it, it can actually be quite healthful. Do you know anything about that? Well, is that something that, some that of, you... Some of the antioxidants that are involved in the, coming out of the red skins, particularly the red wines, uh, all the color uh, in most wines is held in the skin, as well as the tannins. So a lot of the good, good stuff, including those antioxidants, come from the skins. Mm -hmm. We find out scientifically we know almost everything there is to know about wine but do we know magically how to make great wine? Yeah. Uh, we put our passions and our heart and our love into it. Can you taste that? And if that's possible, then maybe the story of the opera is true. 
<laughs> there you go. Exactly. Maybe maybe Nemorino is not quite as naive and innocent as as we think. Uh, perhaps you it know, didn't work as a love potion. It could work as a love potion. Uh, <laughs> we were we were talking earlier. Uh, you told a very interesting story about how the same bottle of wine imbibed by a group of people in a wonderful environment uh, and enjoyed as a community could be taken home and when you open it and taste it it could be completely different yeah that's that's really that's something i think is true i think part of the magic of you know, i think there's 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 adrenaline there's there's uh, endorphins released when you're laughing and having a good time with people and conversations and and if you can't get that level back then the wine may not taste the same mm. doesn't mean it's bad just not tasting the same yeah so the your palate changes from moment to moment uh, and as does your experience with wine. Wine is one of the few beverages that has that characteristic. It's not a beer, it's not a scotch, okay? It's wine. Mm. And wine made from wine grapes is, as you said earlier, going back at least 8,000 years. Um, we know so much about it, but do we know the magic? Mm. Um, I made terrible wine for four years, okay? <laughs> Uh, we distilled it all, or had it distilled to make brandy ports, cherries, and things like that for, for fortification. But learning the magic of putting your love into it and getting that out of it, getting that passion back out of the wine. So not just that I could taste it, but that you can taste it as a, as a uh, consumer. Well, I tell you, it's great stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. And looking forward to trying this uh, delicious Hacienda de las Rosas wine. Thanks. Salute. Salute. I think most of us know by now that Gaetano Donizetti was truly one of the great musical geniuses of the 19th century. He wrote three of the most terrific operatic comedies of that era, Don Pasquale, The Daughter of the Regiment, and today's opera, The Elixir of Love, or L'Elysir d'Amore. But he also wrote Lucia di Lammermoor, one of the greatest Italian tragedies of the age, and an extremely influential opera at that. But what was the essence of his greatness? What was it that he could do better than his operatic colleagues? And what was it about his operas that inspired younger composers like Giuseppe Verdi? In my opinion, it was Donizetti's complete emotional and intellectual grasp of text, of poetry. As you know, the libretto or text of an opera is made up, or at least it's supposed to be made up, of beautiful poetry. Let me give you a musical example, one that you're probably already familiar with, if not by name, then certainly by ear. And that's the famous aria, Una Furtiva Lagrima, from The Elixir of Love. It's sung by the character Nemorino, who believes that all the girls in his village are attracted to him because of this magic elixir that was sold to him by Dr. Durkamara. This is a pure love song, born out by the text, and by the word images that the poet Felice Romani has given to the composer to set. A furtive tear fell from her eyes. She seemed to envy those merry girls. What more am I looking for, he asks. So at the beginning of this text, he's perplexed, certainly, because he doesn't know why she seems sad. But her sadness makes him sad, too. So Donizetti's first musical choice is, in the middle of this delightful comedy, to begin the aria with an orchestra accompaniment that's in a minor key, rather than the usual, at least in 19th century practice, major key. Listen. That minor key sets up the melancholy, sad atmosphere that Donizetti wants to establish for Nemorino. For example, if the piece began in a major key, it would sound like this.
Hear the difference? Okay, then Donizetti decides which instrument of the orchestra will play that accompaniment because it's essentially an accompaniment based on a chord. He chooses a chordal instrument to play it. Not an instrument that can only play one note at a time, like a wind instrument, not a brass instrument, which would be too loud, or a stringed instrument that wouldn't quite have the right texture. So he chooses the harp. Why the harp? Well, probably because it would remind the audience of the guitar or the lute, an instrument that a singer might use to accompany a serenade sung to a beautiful woman. But also because the harp has a special color that allows the notes to kind of resonate into each other and creates an otherworldly sound. So the accompanimental pattern has been established. Now Donizetti has to give us a melody to fit on top of that accompaniment, a melody that fits the words, a furtive tear fell from her eyes, or in Italian, una furtiva lagrima nell'occhi suoi spunto. But he doesn't want the voice to come in right away. We need a little time to establish the mood, the atmosphere, and of course, we want a beautiful melody. So here's the melody he came up with. Shape is another important choice for the composer to make, and choosing to go down rather than up or sideways is really a crucial decision. Now Donizetti uses this as his introduction to the aria, and the singer, the tenor who will sing the role of Nemorino, begins, Una furtiva lagrima. Now don't worry, I'm not going to try to sing it for you. I'll let you do that in your head, because I think we all have some great memories of wonderful tenors like Pavarotti singing this fantastic aria, and I don't want to ruin it for you by trying to croak my way through it. But, and here's the miraculous moment in the aria. What happens when he comes to the text, she loves me, yes, she loves me, I can see it. Well, the music changes character subtly, but completely in order to match the mood of the words. At this point, we're still in the minor mode. But then, turning on a dime, Donizetti moves Nemorino into the major mode for a completely new and different color. Wonderful, right? Even better, near the end of the aria's second verse with the text, Heaven, I could die, I ask for nothing more, we don't just go into the major mode for a few moments. Donizetti actually changes the key of the aria completely, and the piece ends in that major key.
That's the genius of Donizetti. So sensitive to the text, so sensitive to the mood, sensitive to the scenic atmosphere at this moment in the opera. And using the simplest and most elegant of musical tools, the composer has created a whole world for us in one simple aria. I like to present different recordings and DVDs to you in order to help you get to know these operas better before you come to the theater. My job is pretty easy today, at least in terms of CDs, because in my humble opinion, there's only one. It features Luciano Pavarotti as Nemorino, Joan Sutherland as Adina, Dominic Cossa as Belcore, and Spiral Malice as Dulcamara, all under the baton of Richard Bonning go nowhere else. This simply is the recording to get if you don't have one. It's truly exceptional. Luckily, Pavarotti was also filmed in a wonderful Metropolitan Opera production of Elixir under the direction of music director James Levine. It includes Kathleen Battle, Juan Pons, and Enzo Dara. But a little bit more up to date is the reigning pair of lovers in this opera right now, tenor Rolando Viazon and soprano Anna Netrebko from the Great Vienna State Opera under the musical direction of Alfred Eschwe. This production is rounded out by baritone Leo Nucci and bass Ildebrando d'Arcangelo. You can't get a better cast today, and I know you'll enjoy this beautiful traditional production. Now you know why we decided to celebrate Donizetti's success with the Elixir of Love here at Hacienda de las Rosas in Ramona. I mean, what could be better than an Italian opera about the effects of wine and the ambiance that you get from a stroll through the vineyards of an actual winery? See the Elixir of Love. It's comedy with a heart and with gorgeous music to boot. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera. <laughs>